வணக்கம் இந்த ஃபர்ஸ்ட் வீடியோ ஆன் த சீரீஸ் ஆஃப் மேனேஜ்மெண்ட் ஆஃப் அல்லார் நோ பால்சி வி ஷால் டீல் வித் த ஜென்ரல் பிரின்சிபல்ஸ் அண்ட் டெசிஷன் மேக்கிங் பெர் ஹேப்ஸ் த மோஸ்ட் இம்பார்ட்டன்ட் வீடியோ ஆஃப் ஆல் அண்ட் த ஃபர்ஸ்ட் பாயிண்ட்ஸ் டு கன்சிடர் ஆர் த கோல்ஸ் ஆஃப் ரீகன்ஸ்ட்ரக்ஷன் வாட் எக்ஸாக்ட்லி ஆர் வி ட்ரைங் டு அச்சீவ் ஆர் வாட் ஷுட் பி எய்ம் அட் அச்சீவிங் வென் வி ஸ்டார்ட் ட்ரீட்டிங் அ பேஷண்ட் வித் அல்லார் நோ பால்சி த செகண்ட் பாயிண்ட் டு கன்சிடர் is the set of factors that are involved in ulnar nerve palsy the diagnosis is definite it is an ulnar nerve palsy but there are so many variables and all these have to be considered before planning the treatment protocol and we also need to know how to document the problem before starting the treatment having decided to treat the patient we now need to know what are all the options that are available for us in treating this patient with an ulnar nerve palsy and most important of all we need to know the therapy and the rehabilitation that is required to get a complete management protocol before we treat a patient with an ulnar nerve palsy or even before we think of treating a patient with an ulnar nerve palsy we need to understand certain basic principles and when we say the basic principles we are talking about understanding the goals of reconstruction the factors that are involved the options of treatment available and the documentation and assessment of the results the goals of reconstruction refers to the correction of the disabilities that is what we want to achieve in that hand which has been affected by the ulnar nerve palsy we shall see in detail what disabilities occur in ulnar nerve palsy and how we need to correct each of them but that's not enough since we need to consider a lot of factors like the injury factors or the patient factors that are going to influence the decision making about the treatment protocol and having analyzed all the factors that are affecting the treatment we need to consider the options that are available to us which could be a nerve surgery which could be procedures to restore the balance which could be the use of splints or even procedures like arthrodesis and finally we need to understand how to document the problem and how to assess the results based on the deformity based on the movements that are possible and the posture that is possible first let us see in detail about the goals of management as i have said earlier it is very simply put as to correct the disabilities that arise in an ulnar nerve palsy but what are the disabilities it is not just the paralysis of the individual muscles that we are concerned with in ulnar nerve palsy but the disabilities caused by the paralysis of these muscles there are six main disabilities in ulnar nerve palsy and if we understand these disabilities we will understand how they need to be corrected the first disability in the hand affected by nerve palsy only 20% of the pinch power remains the mechanism of normal pinch by the adductor pollicis flexor pollicis brevis and the first dorsal interosseous muscles due to the paralysis of these muscles in ulnar nerve palsy the flexor pollicis longus comes into action and there is instability of the metacarpophalangeal joint leading to hyperextension the second disability is the loss of digital motion all the patients with ulnar nerve palsy can make a full fist but the sequence of flexion of the fingers is totally changed the normal sequence of digital motion consists of first independent primary flexion of the metacarpophalangeal joints by the interosseae and then the long flexors of the fingers take over and complete the flexion whereas in ulnar nerve palsy because there is no primary flexion of the metacarpophalangeal joints since the interosseae muscles are paralyzed the long flexors take over the action of flexion of the metacarpophalangeal joints but they can do this only after the full flexion of the interphalangeal joints the normal sequence of digital motion first metacarpophalangeal joint flexion then flexion of the ip joints by the long flexors in ulnar nerve palsy due to the paralysis of the primary flexors of the metacarpophalangeal joints 
which are the interosseae. The long flexors flex the metacarpophalangeal joint, but first they flex the distal interphalangeal joint, proximal interphalangeal joint, and after they are completely flexed, the metacarpophalangeal joint flexes. Normally, when we want to hold an object, the hand moves towards the object, the metacarpophalangeal joint flexes and then the IP joints flex to tighten the grip around the object. And in ulnar nerve palsy, because of the change in the sequence of digital motion, when the hand goes to grasp the object, the IP joints are already flexed and they are not able to hold the object. For a good precision grip also, the metacarpophalangeal joint must be kept flexed, the interphalangeal joints extended on the fingers and on the thumb, the metacarpophalangeal joint must be kept in minimal flexion and minimal flexion of the interphalangeal joint. But in ulnar nerve palsy, this precision grip is also lost because on the fingers, there is hyperextension at the metacarpophalangeal joints and flexion at the interphalangeal joints and on the thumb, there is hyperextension at the metacarpophalangeal joint and acute flexion at the interphalangeal joint. So the third important disability is the loss of grip. It is seen that there is a reduction of about 55% in the grip strength of the entire hand because the ulnar two digits play a significant role in the overall grip strength of the hand. The next deformity is the clawing. There are four requisites for calling it a clawing. Hyperextension at the metacarpophalangeal joints, flexion at the interphalangeal joints, the presence of intact long flexors and the presence of intact long extensors. The clawing may manifest either immediately or later depending on the laxity of the tissues. If untreated, the claw deformity progresses in the following way. First, it leads to stretching of the central slip, then the volar displacement of the lateral bands and finally a volar plate contracture. The loss of adduction and abduction of the fingers due to paralysis of the dorsal and palmar interosseae is not very significant on its own, but it contributes in four important actions leading to disability. First, in pinch, because the first dorsal interosseous muscle is needed for it. Second, in holding the little finger together with the other fingers. Here, the third palmar interosseous muscle is needed. Third, in precision pinch, where the adducted fingertips are needed and it is not possible because of the paralysis of the palmar interosseae. And lastly, in social customs like eating with the hands, it is important for all the tips of the fingers to come together and this is also lost and it becomes an important disability. The last disability is the loss of span opposition. That is, due to the paralysis of the hypothenar muscles, the span of the hand is reduced and opposition to the little finger is not possible. So far, we have seen six of the major disabilities that occur in a hand affected by ulnar nerve palsy. We shall now see how we can correct these disabilities. One of the main goals in management is to restore pinch and this can be done by replacing the function of the adductor pollicis and the first dorsal interosseous muscles. The procedures by which this can be achieved shall be, see, shall be shown in another video. What we need to understand here are the basic principles that are involved. Another important goal is to restore primary metacarpophalangeal joint flexion of the fingers and this can be achieved by replacing the function of the lumbricals and the interosseae in the hand by various procedures that we shall see in greater detail in the upcoming videos. We also need to restore adduction and abduction of the fingers and this can be achieved by creating the distal palmar arch or by replacing the individual function of the adductors or replacing the function of the third palmar interosseous muscle in case of the little finger. Apart from these six major disabilities, we also have two more disabilities that can occur. The first is the loss of sensation on the ring and little fingers. And this should be corrected as far as possible by reconstructing the digital nerve to the little finger as the sensation to the ulnar border of the hand is very important. Additionally, in high ulnar nerve palsy, there would be a loss of flexion of the distal interphalangeal joint of the ring and little fingers. This must be made good by replacing the function of the flexor digitorum profundus of the ring and little fingers. 
So now we have understood the goals of reconstruction. We shall now see the various factors that are going to be involved and that we need to consider before planning the treatment protocol. I like to consider them as factors that are related to the injury to the ulnar nerve or factors related to the patient. We shall first consider the injury factors like whether it is an acute injury, a chronic injury or a compression neuropathy, whether the injury is combined with other nerve palsies, whether the cause of the ulnar nerve palsy is static or progressive, what is the level of the lesion, whether it is high or low and whether there is a Martin Gruber anastomosis in the forearm of the patient who has had a high ulnar nerve injury. In acute injuries, the treatment is quite simple. Primary repair of the nerve is indicated. In chronic injuries, exploration and repair or reconstruction of the nerve is indicated. In some situations, a tendon transfer that is internal splinting may be indicated. In tardy ulnar nerve palsy or compression neuropathies, the treatment is quite different. In compression neuropathy, injury to the nerve occurs in three stages and the treatment of each stage is different. The first stage is dynamic ischemia which is characterized by intermittent symptoms, normal nerve conduction studies which may be associated with an increased latent period and the treatment of such a condition is conservative management with padding and splinting. However, if there is no relief in 6 months, decompression is preferred. If this dynamic ischemia is not adequately treated, the symptoms become persistent, there is a decrease in the nerve conduction velocity and ends in demyelination of the nerve. Decompression is indicated in such patients and relief can be seen only about 3 to 4 months after the decompression. The final stage of compression neuropathy is axonal loss. This will be characterized by signs of sensory and motor disturbances, a decreased amplitude in the nerve conduction study. It needs only a decompression if the compound motor action potential shows a good amplitude. It needs decompression and supercharged end to side nerve transfer if there is a fibrillation potential and the compound motor action potential shows a low amplitude. If there is a fibrillation potential and the compound motor action potential is absent, other procedures that would be done in a chronic nerve injury are indicated. When combined with other nerve palsies, like in this example where a median nerve palsy is also involved in a patient with electrical burns, we need to remember that the reconstruction should be for both nerves and when planning the tendon transfers, we need to make sure that the particular muscle that is being transferred is not affected. Trauma is a static problem but there are conditions like Hansen's disease where the progression of the injury to the nerve can occur and involvement of the other nerves in the upper limb can also occur. This must be kept in mind while planning the treatment protocol. The involvement of the ulnar nerve may be at a higher level that is proximal to the elbow or at a lower level at any level distal to the elbow. This must be kept in mind while planning the treatment as the needs of reconstruction are different in both these problems. The presence or absence of the Martin Gruber anastomosis is going to modify the treatment protocol in certain ways. This anastomosis is a neural connection from the median nerve to the ulnar nerve in the forearm. It occurs in about 33% of the population and more commonly in the right upper limb. The presence of this nerve anastomosis will signify that some function of the ulnar nerve will be preserved even if the ulnar nerve has been completely transected proximal to the elbow. This can be detected by electrophysiological studies by stimulating the median and ulnar nerves at the elbow and wrist and recording the CMAP of the thenar and hypothenar muscles. A difference in the amplitude of at least 1 millivolt will signify the presence of the Martin Gruber anastomosis. So obviously it becomes significant in a patient with a high ulnar nerve involvement where distal nerve transfers are an option. When this anastomosis is present, we avoid end-to-end -end nerve transfers and prefer end-to-side nerve transfers. So far, we have considered the factors related to the involvement or the injury to the ulnar nerve. Let us see some patient factors also that we need to consider while planning the management. 
the structure of the hands and soft tissues is very important. Some patients have thin, delicate hands with long fingers. Some patients have short, stubby hands with tougher, soft tissue structures. This must be considered when planning the management. A powerful tendon transfer for a long, thin hand may result in an intrinsic plus deformity postoperatively. The occupational needs of the patient should also be considered. He may be a manual laborer or a sedentary worker with light use of the hands at work. The Bouvier test is an important test that needs to be done when examining the patient with ulnar nerve palsy to determine the status of the hand and joints. A detailed clinical examination has been described in a previous video that you can access by clicking the icon above. Let us see the different plans that we need to make for different findings in the Bouvier test. If the Bouvier test is positive, a static procedure will be enough. But dynamic procedures can be done also if we want to add strength to the reconstruction. If the Bouvier test is negative but passive positive, that is the PIP joint passive range is full, we need splints to strengthen the central slip and dynamic procedures need to be done as tendon transfers. But if the passive range is not full but does become full by flexing the wrist, that is tenodes is positive, a finger straightening splint, therapy and passive stretching, flexor lengthening procedures and dynamic tendon transfers need to be done. However, if it is passive negative and at the same time tenodes is negative, it indicates a contracture of the proximal interphalangeal joint and a joint surgical release needs to be done and to improve the extension of the PIP joint, dynamic tendon transfers need to be planned. Patient expectations from the surgery or the treatment are also important. Some patients just want to get back to their manual work. In some parts of the world, like in my country, India, people want to eat with their hands. And by custom, people usually eat with the right hand. When the right hand is involved by ulnar nerve palsy, they are able to eat solid foods but not rice which is a semi-solid mixture of food which is difficult to eat unless the tips of the fingers come together. So reconstruction of the adductors and the transverse metacarpal arch are important in this situation. Some patients just want to get back to doing their activities of daily living. And some patients complain of the loss of sensation on the ulnar border of the hand. This needs to be addressed very importantly in these patients. Holding the key or holding the knife are important activities where the thumb adduction must be restored. Having considered the injury factors and the patient factors, we shall now consider the options of management available. There are four main options available. Nerve surgery, procedures to restore balance, splints and arthrodesis. The nerve surgery may be nerve release or decompression, nerve repair, nerve reconstruction or nerve transfer. Nerve release is indicated in compression neuropathy, Folkman's ischemic contracture where the ulnar nerve may be involved or Hansen's disease. Procedures like anterior transposition of the nerve are also included in this category. Primary nerve repair can be done in acute ulnar nerve injuries and also up to 3 months following injuries if there is no tension at the suture line. On the other hand, nerve reconstruction needs to be done in ulnar nerve injuries after 3 months, acute injuries with loss of segment of the ulnar nerve, Folkman's contracture where there is a segmental loss of the ulnar nerve as occurs in electrical burn injuries too. Distal nerve transfers are mainly indicated in proximal ulnar nerve injuries. The details of all these procedures on the nerve will be discussed in a forthcoming video. When the motor end plates of the intrinsic muscles of the hand are destroyed, either due to chronicity or the injury, nerve surgery may not be useful. Other procedures may be indicated and these procedures may be static or dynamic procedures. Static procedures are done when the Bouvier test is positive. These procedures basically stabilize the metacarpophalangeal joint in minimal flexion, allowing the long extensors 
to extend the interphalangeal joints. This stabilization can be done at the level of the skin, at the level of the tendon, the bone or the joint capsule and the details will be seen in a forthcoming video. We have already seen that the dynamic procedures are indicated in some situations of Bouvier test results and the details of these dynamic procedures will be discussed in a later video. The use of splints is very important in ulnar nerve palsy. The classic claw correction splint may be static or dynamic. The indications for applying the claw correction splint are after primary repair or reconstruction of the ulnar nerve when they need to be worn for 6 weeks after removal of the POP till further evaluation, before reconstruction of the ulnar nerve or tendon transfer procedures to prevent stretching of the central slip or after tendon transfer procedures for 6 weeks after removal of the POP that had been applied postoperatively. The claw correction splints are also indicated in compressive neuropathy while symptoms abate. The static claw correction splint stabilizes the MCP joint but the patient can extend his interphalangeal joints. This is important because it keeps the intrinsic muscles moving passively. It prevents stretching of the central slip and keeps the extensors active and also helps in some activities of daily living. The dynamic claw correction splint as demonstrated in this video in addition to the effects of the static splint also keeps the metacarpophalangeal joints active and increases the span of the hand. Other splints are also used in ulnar nerve palsy like the boutonniere correction splint, the finger straightening splint, serial splinting in conditions where the proximal interphalangeal joint is stiff, neutral wrist splinting in case of compression at the Guyans canal or elbow extension splinting in cases of cubital tunnel syndrome. Finally, the procedure of arthrodesis that is fusion of the IP joints can also be considered in certain situations where overall return of better function can be achieved, especially when there is a paucity of motors for transfer like in pan brachial plexus palsy after flexor power of fingers is obtained or conditions like triple nerve palsy. When there is a stiffness of the PIP joints which are not amenable to splinting or corrective surgery, it is better to do an arthrodesis. Having chosen the option of management, we need to first document the problem and then analyze the ways of assessing the results of any treatment protocol. The actual assessment of the problem can be based on the deformity, the movement or the posture. Based on the deformity, the problem can be mild, moderate or severe depending on the assisted angle at the proximal interphalangeal joint. Based of the movement, we need to assess three movements, open hand assessment, close fist analysis and mechanism of closing by which the results can be excellent, good, fair or poor. Assessment can also be based on the posture that can be achieved in the hand. The first posture is the ability to fully and freely extend all the finger joints with no extension lag or fixed flexion deformity and no hyperextension at the PIP joints or flexion at the DIP joints. Now these two would indicate intrinsic transfer overactivity. The second posture is the ability to flex the finger metacarpophalangeal joints without flexion at the interphalangeal joints that is the lumbrical plus position. The next posture should be the ability to flex the interphalangeal joints without flexing the metacarpophalangeal joints that is the hook position. The next should be the ability to flex the fingers fully and make a tight fist. The patient should also be able to open the hand completely without abduction of the fingers or hyperextension of the metacarpophalangeal joints. Lastly, the patient should be able to restore separate lumbrical movement of each finger such that each finger can flex at the metacarpophalangeal joint without flexing the interphalangeal joints while the other fingers remain straight and this is possible because the transfer normally provides a balancing tone between the long flexor and extensor finger muscles that move the finger. Let us now summarize the decision making process with relation to the time duration in low and high ulnar nerve palsy 
and the different procedures that are indicated. In low ulnar nerve palsy, less than a month old, a nerve repair or reconstruction is indicated. Tendon transfer may be indicated but distal nerve transfer is not indicated. The indicated procedures are same for a 3 month old low ulnar nerve palsy. But here it is nerve reconstruction rather than nerve repair. If the time duration is 1 year, a nerve reconstruction is definitely indicated, a tendon transfer indicated but a distal nerve transfer is not indicated again because it is a low ulnar nerve palsy. In high ulnar nerve palsy, on the other hand, a nerve procedure may be indicated, a tendon transfer would be indicated and a distal nerve transfer can also be indicated. I hope you enjoyed the video. I enjoyed making it. Kindly click on the shown links to see more about the ulnar nerve anatomy and the clinical examination of a patient with an ulnar nerve palsy. And do not forget to subscribe to keep connected with the latest in learning hand surgery.